Welcome back to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. This is another interview in the neurodivergent series that I'm currently putting out there. And I'm super excited to have Amy Burgess on. She is a neurodivergent bookkeeper herself. And so we're going to just dive into all things around, around this. Hey, and welcome to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. I'm Serena Shoup, CPA, a mom of three, and I've been running a virtual bookkeeping business from my home since 2017. You are in the right place if you are a bookkeeper, accountant, or an accounting student, and you believe and know in your heart that your purpose is bigger than sitting in a cubicle. If you're ready to learn some actionable tips and strategies for starting and growing your accounting business, then I hope you stick around. So, hey, Amy, how are you today? Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm good. Thanks, Serena. I'm Amy Burgess. I have a, just a boutique, small, just getting going, a little bookkeeping firm called Jointly Balanced. And I mean, now I just found myself in the, the niche of serving other neurodivergent people. So I've kind of started to lean in towards that. And um yeah, I guess that's yeah. awesome. Now I'm super excited to like chat about some of the just different ways that you operate and then what you provide to clients that support their neurodivergence. You know what I mean? So I guess we could start with internal operations. You said you you're just getting started. So what was what were you doing before this business, this bookkeeping business? Oh, I mean it was very all over the place. <laughs> but I mean, now that I know, I'm very, I was diagnosed very late in life, just within the last couple of years. So like after I was 40. So it was like I'd gone through most of my life not knowing that I was dealing with that. So it was kind of like I, I used to be very like, oh, just think that I couldn't really get anything going. I was kind of a failure because I had many started and stopped. Ventures. <laughs> and I've tried to work from, I've gone back and forth, bounced back and forth between working for myself, having that not working, filling that in with um, way back when, when my English degree was not <laughs> doing anything for me, I took a certification for like bookkeeping through the community college. Mm -hmm. But of course they don't really, they just teach you how to do that. And then they don't tell you really like, well, how do you... Mm -hmm if you were going to get your own clients or if you were going to even get a job because I found myself like, you know, if I hadn't had any formal corporate like office environment, they just weren't really, I never found anyone willing to kind of take me on as, okay, like we'll be the one to be like, trust your skills and that we can, that you can deal with this. But so it's always felt like that was like a pushback too. It was like, I'm just like now officially just leaning into the fact that like I'm gonna treat this like a business and actually go into it because I have done stuff on the side I've done volunteer bookkeeping for nonprofits and like contract work here and there but yeah like nothing that really so like I think a lot of my like confidence issues like once I realized I had this combination of I have ADHD plus autism like I'm autistic and the ADHD and they kind of fight each other and <laughs> create a nice unique balance but when I found that out it let me realize kind of why I've had the difficulties I've had and then once knowing that then kind of create be like oh like it's not that I can't do this. It's just that I have to maybe find different approaches and different ways around it. So, so yeah, once I figured out, like, I mean, I'd met other people with ADHD, realized that the whole career, like bouncing all over the place <laughs> seemed very common. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to just think that like, oh no, that's going to hold me back. And I, I'm not one of those people that can say, I've been doing this for solidly for, you know, 20 years or I have like all this experience and stuff like that. I mean, and I do when I add it up and kind of piece it all together, but it's kind of having to look at that and then trust yourself to be like, oh, okay. I, I think I, I know more than I give myself credit for. <laughs> I think. Yeah. Especially from all of those experiences, you know what I mean? Like everything you've been through all these different experiences for a reason, but you can draw from those and pull them into your bookkeeping business, which I think is really, really valuable. What do you think 
what is it about bookkeeping and the work that we do that you feel is a good fit for being neurodivergent? Well, just from my from your own experience, own lived experience. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I never want to talk for anyone else because I know it's like yeah. You know, I mean, everyone you know it's affected differently and everything. But for me, I think it was it's latching on to that kind of like it's a balance of like the puzzle, just kind of like trying to figure stuff out for people. Like they don't want to get into that and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But like, actually, like if like I can get into like a cleanup job for like just getting in there because I want to like find what's going on and then at the end help somebody. So you get that. And I think that's like a thing that really drew me towards deciding to work for myself because I didn't want to work for somewhere where I was just, back in a room doing bookkeeping and it got sent off and someone else is doing the front facing client work mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because then I realized that I'm not getting that, like that part of it. That and then, you know, it's like, yeah. yeah, I actually like, like once you like get into it and you're the one that's been working and their stuff, like then I also want to be the one having those conversations with people. Cause otherwise it feels very detached yeah. for me. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. I like to see the full cycle through, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I totally get that. So do you prefer doing like project work versus the monthly or do you feel good about both or where is your preference? Like if you had to choose how to steal your time all the time, what would you prefer to be doing? Um, I mean, I don't know, probably like a mix. I mean, the monthly... I do like kind of like once you have that connection with a client and like get with them. I mean, I definitely like the long term like relationships you can build and because you kind of you get through that initial stuff and then just kind of know how each other work and find that good like flow of like working together. You know, I mean, like the project work can be something that's like it can be fine for the time. But yeah, I definitely don't think I would like want to do that completely and not have the the ongoing client work where you really get to build those long term. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've discovered for yourself in your business and how you operate that you think has contributed to your success, whether it is like the way you work, like the way you schedule your week or the way that you're able to connect with clients? Like what are some of the main things that you've set up for yourself that you're like this? I know this really works for me and I'm going to continue doing it. <laughs> yeah, I think just making, well, making plans and like planning it out, not just winging it because that doesn't exactly ever help yeah. <laughs> or ever work out. But but also leaving space for like flexibility within that because, and I think like my brain, I have to really, I have a really hard like line of like, I want to like black and white, like thinking, and I want to put things in their nice like little mm -hmm. boxes, like this is wrong and this is right. And I always have to kind of check myself with that because that's, you know, it's not how things are, yeah. those things that, you know, everything kind of falls in between. And I always have to, I mean, again, just like knowing that about yourself, like I, you can always like check in and be like, you know, like when I'm thinking this and just like when I like first started getting a thing, like, I mean, I was like having to kind of find what marketing and anything like that worked for me because I mean, I was just trying to take people's formulas and just thinking that this is the right way to do it. Yeah. You know, this is how you do it. Why isn't this working? <laughs> and yeah, so just like at a lot of points, just, you know, stepping back and realizing if something isn't working to try to figure out like where like I could like tweak things mm -hmm. and and make it easier, you know, like, yeah, instead of just trying to force it. Yeah. Which, honestly, any business owner can take that advice, <laughs> whether yeah. you're neurodivergent or not. Everyone gets kind of like sucked into like, well, that worked for the other person. So everything works if you want to follow that process, right? But it's like, does it work with the way that we want to work and our values and our like our schedules and the way our brain works? <laughs> um, because it can be like trudging through quicksand if if it's something that just like is really not in alignment 
So you mentioned marketing. Is there a specific way of marketing that you were trying that you're like, this was not working for me versus what you're doing now that feels really good and seems to be working? Well, I think just like trying to just pump out like social media posts and stuff like that and just feeling like, yeah, I mean, like, I guess that can work to an extent for visibility, but then just like during that being like nothing's happening and then having to realize that, oh, well, it's like just kind of to blast that all out there isn't necessarily doing anything for you. If like, I mean, it's basically just needing to have like actually have conversations with people and do that. But like, that's not what everyone was talking about because that isn't the nice, like <laughs> fun way to, to do things. So I think like, yeah, just having to learn that the approaches, while they might be slower, they're actually kind of like, they'll work for you and you'll end up with better clients, I think overall. Anyways, taking the time to actually find out who like you connect with rather than just, just, oh, I blasted this in front of X number of people Mm -hmm. and some eyeballs saw it (laughs) and like take that approach. So you mentioned that you recently started attracting more neurodivergent business owners. So do you have clients that are in that realm too? And is there something that like you're able to do differently for them that maybe they weren't getting that level of support before or any like pointers that you have for people that are listening? Maybe also like maybe this is a market I should look into supporting as well. Yeah, definitely. I think like I found a lot of it is probably going to happen in the initial like onboarding and that part. I think it's the time where people are the most like, especially if they've had, I mean, I found a lot of people just have had kind of, they have those bad experiences that they didn't, that didn't really work for them. And they kind of come in carrying that with them and, you know, you kind of have to like ease them in, let them know that like, yeah, like I'm like, that I I am going to like work with you. And that's why like, I mean, I did go back and forth, like feeling like, oh, do I really want to be, do, do I want to be open and talking about this and lean into this Mm -hmm. like thing? But then I realized like, well, especially, I mean, I may not have known anyways since I learned a thing, but like, had I been diagnosed and known, like, I mean, I also, even if I did, I hadn't seen anybody openly really talking about that. So I guess also I just don't want to like add to the people. So if they'll see that, like they can know like, oh, that doesn't mean this isn't for me just because you just kind of have to like, like, again, a lot of things may not fit. And that's how I try to kind of approach things with, and I could just draw on like my experiences too, because I've, I know I get that like super, like, just like feeling of if I have to talk to like a lawyer or, you know, like, like a person where you already have that, like, you know, you're not going in with the information. You feel like they have the, you know, kind of have that hanging over you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like you go in there hoping that they're going to like, also not just be like, oh, like disregard how you're feeling about that and just try to be like, you know, I think just like kind of acknowledging guys again, like I've just realized the more open that I've been, then people are open to new thing because nobody's, if there's nothing that you've said, so I just try to be the first person to put that out there and like, let them know, Hey, if you need, like, if you have communication preferences or if you have this new thing, like, and let them, and they don't, you know, that lets them decide they don't have to disclose anything. That's like, anything could help. Like it could help anyone who is like that. So they don't like feel like, It opens up if they want to, they can disclose, but also they can just choose what works best for them and feel they're still getting that support if even if they don't. Yeah, because everyone everyone has their own communication preferences and how they retain and learn best. And that's something that I've always had on my like onboarding intake form or maybe it's even on the proposal when they sign up, like sign the proposal or whatever, there's a section on the bottom that's like, what's your preferred method of communication, phone, email, text, or other. And this might be like controversial because on the one hand, to have operations streamlined, right? And you want to have all the communication in one place so that things don't get lost. 
But on the other hand, if you are interested in serving in a more accessible way, it requires some flexibility. I do give my clients option of email or text message because we have like open phone. So it's not like it's my personal number. I didn't have that option before whenever I only had a Google voice, although I could have, but now we have open phone and the whole team can see the whole communication. You can schedule text messages, you can all, all sorts of stuff. So there's that. And then a couple of my clients are verbal like processors. And so they want either a monthly meeting or to be able to communicate with me through Voxer. That's not something that I openly like advertise <laughs> to people. But if they ask for it, heck yeah, I will communicate with them through Voxer. And I just have to be mindful and like remember to copy whatever communication over into our internal Slack channel so that the whole team is aware of what's being communicated. You know what I mean? So it's like, it can still work. You can still have communication in multiple places as long as like you have a system for capturing all of it and making sure nothing falls through the cracks. But yeah, so that's kind of how I handle it with the communication stuff. And I think that's a big deal for clients because if you talk to like almost every business owner out there that has had a, a bookkeeper or an accountant, their biggest complaint is lack of communication. <laughs> or if it is, it's just very like a lot of friction, not personalized, yeah. not personalized communication, yeah. like, oh. like just kind of spitting out a report and mm -hmm. that's it. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, that if, if that's what works for you too, if like you don't want to have that deeper communication, then that's fine. Set your business up for whatever works for you. But I've been really interested in hearing from other like neurodivergent business owners and how like they process things and what they find helpful in a bookkeeper that understands them. And then also talking to, I think you're the first bookkeeper so far in my series that I'm talking to that is neurodivergent. And maybe some of them are also kind of targeting that market as well. Um, so yeah, I've just been like really curious, like, well, how do you operate that sets you apart or that is like more inclusive for your clients and things like that? It's been, it's been really fun learning. And I've, I get ideas from these two. I'm like, oh, I could do this better. <laughs> I could do that better for any business owner. Like these things help for all business owners, but yeah. And then each of us are different too. in our preferences of how we work, like one thing you said is planning and I think Obviously, that's valuable for everyone again, but some people can just retain things in their mind and not lose track of time the way that we do. <laughs> so like I live by my calendar on my phone. I live by reminders and timers. And and like I was explaining this to one of my friends recently because they were like, oh, I need to get better at that. And I was like, yeah, it's been a process to get to where I'm at right now, but like the bigger game changers for me is like carving out time each weekend to sit down and look at the calendar ahead, visually write out what's happening in my planner so that I can like, it just like helps solidify things. And then it makes me more aware of like what I have coming up that I might need to carve out time a day or two ahead of in order to manage the work. So I'm not like scrambling the night before <laughs> procrastination because I'm like, oh crap, I have this meeting I have to be prepared for or whatever. That and then like I have recurring timers on my phone for specific things that I have to do every day. Like that if I didn't have that, they wouldn't get done. As simple as taking my vitamins <laughs> <laughs> and calling my children when I don't have them, like because I lose track of time. And if there's not a timer that buzzes, I'm like, Oh no, they're probably already in bed. <laughs> so I don't know. I think we need to normalize that a little more. <laughs> definitely get that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I too just like, what's well, something that works for me is I've realized I kind of like time block and make days for things. Yes. Cause that's just easier for me. If like this day is like, I have client calls or like, or I know this day, I don't have any meetings, any outward things to do. I can just, Focus. you know, get into client work and not know I'm going to like worry about missing 
something that's coming up. So that's really helpful to me too. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of doing like the theme days because I'm the same. If there's calls sprinkled out in the day, I just know I'm not going to get any client work done or any project stuff done like other than checking email. Like I just don't plan on it. So I have to have full days where there's no calls in order for me to like focus on actual work. <laughs> just even before we went on this interview, I had like a little bit of extra time between my last call that I wasn't really expecting. And I went down a rabbit hole in my emails and I was late <laughs> to this call. So it's like, even then I, yeah, you lose track. And I'm like, oh, I have time to answer this email. And then it's been 15 or 20 minutes and now I'm late. <laughs> For anyone listening who is thinking about starting a bookkeeping business, I always like to ask this question. I don't always ask it, but when I remember to ask it, since you are, like you said that you're kind of at the beginning stage, is kind of newer in your business of like kind of going all in, you're really close to all the stuff that comes with that. And so do you have any pointers or words of encouragement, even either or, or both <laughs> for anyone listening who is thinking about starting a bookkeeping business and just hasn't really made that leap yet? I think a big thing I had to get used to is like to not let yourself get too isolated. Like even for me, I mean, I mostly love curling up at home. <laughs> <laughs> being quiet yeah. and everything but so I kind of like I think it surprised myself like how much if you just like realize you don't have like natural like as much like interaction like throughout the day and just to like really like acknowledge that I can and need like help like I you know I need resources and I need like other things like not just having to just think that I can just do everything on my own yeah has been yeah like leaning into that doing like a co-working has been really useful for me is then I realized kind of why because that you know can be called as like body doubling in the neurodivergent space to be like and like kind of why that might be helpful to me but it can be helpful to anyone too that can be helpful to kind of give yourself some accountability to actually hold yourself to like I need to do this work today yeah yeah, one thing that I do, I host co-working sessions for the folks in my BIT program, and I've participated in other co-working sessions within other networks and groups. And one thing that makes me nervous about them anytime I agree to them is like, I actually really do want to get stuff done and I don't want to be chit-chatting, but it is helpful to be on a co-working session. So just like if you are going to do a co-working session, just be like, if you're going to be the one hosting it, or you're not the one hosting it, it's totally appropriate to ask like what the structure is like, because I haven't joined some co-working sessions because I'm afraid it's gonna be too chit-chatty, but I would really benefit from it. You know what I mean? Not the chit-chat, but like just being in a co-working session. And so that's one thing that like the way that I set mine up for anyone listening, if this is something you're interested in doing, I highly recommend it, but we do 90 minutes and I use a Pomodoro timer. So we do like, three 25 minute chunks of focused work. And then in between we do a five minute break. And I just encourage everyone to like get up, go get some water, go to the bathroom and unmute during that five minutes. And then after that, we go back on mute, you can turn your cameras off or whatever. And then I put on like focus music so that like there is no chit chatting happening, but people can chat in the, in the chat if they have questions for me, like, because I'm also there to support them as like a facilitator, but you don't have to do that piece. You could just be like, we are not talking. <laughs> Everyone's gonna be muted and we're just gonna focus. So yeah, being able to facilitate those things is also a skill. <laughs> But yeah, for ho hopefully anyway. Yeah, I guess I've gotten lucky. I haven't even ran into that. But yeah, I don't think I would like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you so much for sharing your experience on the podcast and hoping with this interview series that people just have more awareness around the different possibilities to structure their businesses, the different things that other business owners might need. And I just, I'm super grateful that you were willing to come on here and chat about this and spread the knowledge and awareness so that we can just have a more 
inclusive business world. <laughs> so thank you. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Where is the best place for people to connect with you if they're interested in being part of your network? <laughs> just kind of like still getting all my online stuff set up, but just probably through Instagram, mm-hmm. jointly balanced. Cool. Awesome. I'll link that in the show notes. And so, yeah, if you are also a neurodivergent bookkeeper and you want to connect with Amy, please do that on Instagram. Thank you again, Amy, so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who helps make this podcast possible. Content and interviews are produced by me, Serena Shu. Our intro and outro music is written and performed by my brother, Ian Gilliam. Editing is also by Ian using his awesome sound engineering skills along with Descript software. Hosting and publishing is by Buzzsprout. And you can check out the show notes for links to all of these amazing resources and resources mentioned in the episode. Be ambitious. 